Welcome to Everyone Loves Guitar, where we sit down and talk with interesting professional guitar players, uncover their stories, and discover what makes them tick. If you love guitar, music, and the backstory of people's lives, stick around. You're in the right place. Hi, this is Craig. Just want to let you know you can now advertise here on Everyone Loves Guitar podcast. For more information, go to everyonelovesguitar.com forward slash advertise. That's everyonelovesguitar.com forward slash advertise. Hey, everybody. This is Craig Garber with Everyone Loves Guitar. And in my continued pursuit to find every great guitar player in New York City, we got another one with Johnny Lamb today. Johnny is a steel player and a guitar player, pedal steel and lap steel. Lap steel sorry. He's a member of Syncane, and he's toured all over the world with them. He's also part of the Atomic Bomb Band Supergroup, and he leads his own band called Honeyfingers, and he recorded an album with Jim Campolongo, who I interviewed a while ago. Johnny's work with a real diverse array of bands and producers in the studio and on stage. Check these names out. David Byrne, Nora Jones, Billy Joe Armstrong, Emmy Lou Harris, Busta Rhymes. What a diversity. Emmy Lou Harris, Busta Rhymes, and Billy Joe Armstrong. When's the last time those three names were mentioned sequentially? Um, Benny Blanco, Keb Moe, Sean Paul, Steve Earle, Pharaoh Sanders, the Blind Boys of Alabama, Jamie Liddell, Charles Lloyd, Taj Mahal, again, Jim Campolongo, and Alexis Taylor from Hot Chip and more. He recently finished a tour just, uh, I think, last week with uh, Miranda Lambert, where he got to play up at the Ryman in Nashville. He also played with the American Grammy Awards for the Emmy Lou Harris tribute with Emmy Lou, Steve Earle, Brandy Carlisle, Jennifer Nettles. He finished an Exotica EP, and he is working on new music written the last year on tour which combines elements of rock jazz and chinese traditional melodies dude you're uh what are you doing in your free time you know i hang out <laughs> with the dog <laughs> hang out with the girlfriend and the dog good for you man what's how ha- what's happening today uh nothing just went for a walk and with the did the morning walk with the puppy and then uh good yeah man. this well thanks for coming on the show johnny you pay you play pedal and lap steel and also electric. How'd you get into playing pedal and you know steel guitar? That is not very common, especially in New York City. And Luca Benedetti told me you're not just a good steel player. He said you're like amazing. So like <laughs> when Luca Benedetti says that, that's a pretty impressive, you know, credibility thing there, man. So how did you get involved in pedal and lap steel? Uh, well, first, I'd like to say thanks to Luca for the exaggeration. But, uh, <laughs> I, uh, you know, like every every guitar player moves to New York, and they're like trying to be involved in the micro economy of singer songwriters. And I guess at some point, I started playing in like alt country bands. And I was like, oh, like, I think I can play pedal steel. And then I'll become like, you know, one of a handful of pedal steel players in New York. And I picked it up and it was a lot harder than I thought it would be. I thought because I could play like that cliche pedal steel lick on guitar that it would be an easy transition. But it is, it is not, you know. How long have you been playing pedal steel? I feel like it's always been just three years, but I think it's been three years for probably almost 10 years. Good for you, man. <laughs> so well, that's just smart, though. You you wanted to create literally a business differential for yourself, which I think is super smart, you know? And obviously, you've done it, worked it hard enough that it's yours now. Well, I, I think that uh, now I'm glad that I play Steel, and I really enjoy it in it. When I first started playing, it was I really felt a good kinship to the instrument, like the the E9 pedal steel, the country neck, kind of has all of the information built in stylistically. So in a way, for a musician like many of us are with all so much pedagogy and like all the books and all the videos, you can learn a lot of different styles you don't necessarily develop your own personal sound or, you know, focus on that because everyone's just feels like 
you're trying to sink or swim, you know, you're trying to stay above water, like how trying to be really good and trying to like take a good solo and like learn all your modes. And those are totally important things. But uh, when I started playing steel, you kind of get trapped into this box and it, in a way it's very difficult to break out, but because your base is, is, is a lot, the base level of like what E9 pedal steel sounds like is really common. And everyone is, everyone knows it. Like everyone knows the one to the four chord move so stylistically you kind of get a little bit of a break because as you panic to learn the instrument you still have like a pretty high bass level of satisfaction you know but if i just gave a kid a guitar and i was like hey here's the pentatonic scale here's the blues scale then what happens they don't sound like bb king you know they might not even remotely sound like bb king even if they're playing the same notes they probably won't you know bb king is there's a lot of other things in music but in pedal steel you do that move and everyone knows that move you know that's like a 20th century that's like an iconic thing that one chord to the four chord you know the web pure slowly move you know so i think that steel guitar is was really important for me in terms of beginning to focus on developing my own personal identity and kind of relieving my brain of like, I'm not Wes Montgomery. I'm not Jimi Hendrix. I'm not all these people, you know, that's really cool. So you started this new journey and, and I think that's so cool when you go down a road that you're looking for one thing and something else really cool comes out of it that gives you, that was never in your mind. You know, it's like very rewarding when that happens. Right. Yeah. Really cool, man. How come? Sorry, just right into it, right into like the a really long response. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was good, man. It was very cool. What, what, what is the like? When I left New York in '89, and I've been back almost every year since, just to yeah, hang. Yeah. But like, what is this? Where did the alt country? Because there's like, like bars and tons of guys playing, or and you know, guys, people, players playing alt country, and like. I don't think you'd probably get shot if you even played country, you know, when I left New York city, it was not the, you know, what the scene is now, where did that evolve from? Or how do you think it evolved? I, I, they, you know, like they've been talking about like the country alt country scene in New York for a long time. I get, you know, long time relative, like, yeah, you know, Ryan Adams, like Jayhawks, like <laughs> that kind of thing. And there was like a big, there was like kind of a, a movement about like this Brooklyn country scene, maybe I think 10 or 15 years ago, you know? Um, but it was like, I guess now I feel like a lot people are de delving more into like the later classic country instead of like the 40s and 50s people are more focused on like the country rock like 60s and 70s and like you know like the outlaw country has become more of a thing in culture as well as the scene in new york and uh want you know i'm sure as you've talked to many of the players in new york there's a bar in town that has live music seven days a week and like the, the rodeo bar used to do they've it's pretty well curated with like all these kind of country groups that are playing the music of like emmy lou harris or you know and you know like paycheck and all that george jones and all that kind of stuff and those are like their role models rather than you know playing hank williams tunes which is great also but mm. a di a rhythmically different there's more of like a I think there's more young people starting to do that, I yeah, guess, and totally. that would be why there's such like a evolution. And culturally, there's a in music, there's like a whole country music scene that's like more of a throwback rather than pop country. Where is what bar is are you talking about? Oh, that bar skin that bar is called Skinny Dennis. I, oh, know, that's, I cut oh, that's in there. Brooklyn. That's in Brooklyn, in Williamsburg, Brooklyn. Yeah, yeah. And it's the whole scene is mostly in Brooklyn because, like, in in the city, it's still the jazz thing. I mean, I think they the the they have that Opry City stage. You know, they're trying to do stuff, and there's a lot of bars that have live music, and country bands are part of that. Oh, are they? Okay. But, yeah. 
No, that's you awesome. You know, the old Banjo Jims is a venue called, the, you know, a bar called the Wayland now, and they have music sometimes. And, um, yeah, there's there's bars that do it. Hill Country still has country music, you know, seven days a week, I think. And Hill Country? I thought that was like a – isn't that a ribs place? It's like a corporate barbecue place. Yeah, that's what I thought. Yeah. I think I actually went there like five – Maybe four or five. I played there like uh, five two weeks ago. Did you really? Well, dude, I'm I'm coming back to the city like in the end of October. I'm going to look you guys up. I'd love to see one of you. One of you all playing. Every time I come, no one's playing. Anyway, it's like like the weekend shut down or something. Jim Campolongo is always playing. He's a legend. He has so much energy for his for music. It's so crazy. He's he's awesome. It's so difficult to do what he has done, and you know, to play that regular gig for however many years and. It takes like a lot of effort and it takes a lot of energy and it's really impressive that he just keeps doing it, you know? Well, he's extremely organized and he has a lot and he does the lessons thing online. I mean, he's extreme. Let me tell you that my first encounter with Jim, he's, I think maybe a second time we communicated, I get an email at 430 in the morning. Because like, he had well, just gotten up. That's when he gets up. Right. And I, so I, <laughs> then when I'm talking on the phone, I'm like, you know, Jim, I, I spoke to you, you don't seem like the guy that was like going to bed at four thirty in the morning. So like, what's the deal? He goes, Oh no, I get at four thirty every day. And this way I could, I could have my three hours of practice and get all my stuff done. But that's why he sounds like Jim Campolongo, you know, but he is so disciplined. That guy. I mean, he's mm-hmm. just, just a, a master. Talk about sin cane because you guys are incredibly popular. You make very melodic music and you have a rabid following. And um, I was curious, how did you hook up with the band? And if you could just give a background to the band and the kind of music you play and, and where you've toured for people that may not know you guys. Uh, sin cane is the brainchild of Ahmed Jalab, who's a Sudanese American. He's a amazing musician. He, he played in like hardcore bands, legendary hardcore bands from Kent, Ohio and Columbus, Ohio. And uh, he got his uh, his first break was with Caribou and uh, ended up playing with of Montreal and Yesayer all at their peaks, you know. And finally, he started to pursue his own project. And it kind of has morphed from like a kraut rocky spiritual jazz self-made records by himself which is insane he's an insane person and then, and then uh he started to incorporate a band and you know it was a quartet for a while and with a different guitar player and i ended up joining we had some mutual friends and we had played together with uh, a great singer songwriter cooper formant and that's how we initially met. And then uh, fast forward, like maybe a year and a half later, he's like, hey, do you want to like get together and jam? And I was like, I know. You know, I was like deep in like full on like New York. This is the first time in my life that I had been like playing nonstop. And I had my own band that Honey Fingers and we were playing like four nights a week, like 12 hours on the bandstand. It was a really insane time for me. And he's like, do you want to like jam? And I was like, okay, you know, who is this guy? I, you know, I know what jamming means. You're, you're trying to like get an audition, you know? Right. right. So we get together, get to play with uh, Ahmed and this the drummer for Sin Kane. Until recently, Jason Trammell, J Tram. And we just like vibe and had a good time. And Ahmed said to me, hey, like uh, we're doing this thing. And Ahmed and I had hung out a couple times before that. And he disappeared on tour for a year, which is why that happened. And we had a great time. We bonded over Buffalo Wings and, you there know, you he loves country music. And and uh, he's like, hey, I'm like, uh, we're going to go to Australia in like two months. Do you want to go? And I was like, yeah. You know? <laughs> I was like, okay. You know, and he's like, and then we're going to like do this thing, this project with David Byrne. Do you want to do that? And I was like, yeah, okay. Twist my then, arm. Yeah. And then he's <laughs> like, how do you feel about touring? And I was like, ah, I don't, I don't know. I don't really want to go on tour. I kind of got this thing in New York happening and I feel good about it. And then like fast forward, like, you know, five years later and Australia, New Zealand, Africa, 
Europe many, many, many times, the whole states, like, you know, more than, you know, 130 gigs a year, it's awesome, you know, man. like, and here we are, you know, that's great, man. I'm happy for you. What, um, what is your role with the band? You do steel and electric or I mainly play electric guitar yes. and I do, and I'll play pedal steel for some tunes. There's a couple tunes that have a steel guitar feature and on the last record, there is actually a lot of pedal steel on it, but it's all affected and in the background. So you kind of just get the the lift of pedal steel slightly, but not as literal as on the as on the record before Mean Love, where there were two songs where it was like very literally country music influenced, and there's like straight up pedal steel. Cool, man. Do you, do you yeah. contribute on the writing end as well? Yeah, I help uh, I help out with arrangements and and Ahmed is generous with how he feels like we contribute and so you know it's mostly like in arrangements and the it's been at first Ahmed comes in with like these things almost fully realized it's pretty incredible you know like they could be they could be a record but he has allowed people more and more into his process which is hard because as an artist you I you want to you want to create the thing that's in your mind and he has the capability to do that and it's incredible um so as he's come further along in the project he's been able to release himself for, with the literal translations of what he has in his mind and he's able to say i want johnny to contribute or i want elena the keyboard player and mm. to contribute and he'll just do a s- sketch and he'll say well you know something like that but a lot of times the thing that he puts down is kind of the thing you know because yeah. it's like this vision and so removing myself and my ego from like oh i need to like i'm the guitar player i have to contribute with the guitar part he's he's allowed all of us to contribute in a more holistic way which i believe is a lot healthier you know as a side man in new york you, we are beholden to how good we are but what does that even mean especially as a guitar player because it's like well everyone can well, have so many good guitar players and but what does that even mean because a guy who's technically so good will fit in one project but maybe to be too technical for another project so it's always like which guitar player specifically guitar is fits the vibe you know so if you fit the vibe you can or like accept that like the the vibe is more important than yourself and say okay i don't have to be judged on like a guitar solo that doesn't like mean anything in terms of how i contribute to music you know it could but to be for that to be the thing that is your validation is a dangerous and scary thing because what musically what does it mean you know it may mean nothing to a lot of music but it may mean everything to music but i think that a balance between the two of like oh how do i contribute to the song what does this song mean and a solo can contribute to that rather than like i need to play a perfect guitar solo you know does my guitar or like it's just another part in music so how long did it take you playing as a professional till you got to the point where you sort of realize that where you know it's a tough thing because you you spend all these years alone in a room with your guitar doing that thing and then you you, you know you you're basically saying hey i realize that doesn't validate me you know and that's a and you're right it doesn't but how long did it take you to to get to that point or to re- just to realize that i guess i mean it's taken my whole life until f- pretty recently you know yeah. like i just finished an exotica record this year and th- this record came about because I had written some music and I had tried to force it into what I believed was the sound of Honey Fingers, which I no longer have uh, like a – what is that? What is that word? Like I don't, I don't feel like Honey Fingers is in a box. It's just a thing that happens and I'm involved and, you know, and we – I just make music, whatever it's, I guess it would be like steel guitar centric. So I like tried to make like a Western swing, you know, like a Texas swing kind of band music. And I had wrote, written some tunes and I, and I was going to go work at, uh, 
go to record this at a friend studio, Restoration Sound in Williamsburg. And he had like an Ampex mono tape machine. And he's like, oh, you got to come and just like cut something mono live. And I was like, hell yeah, you know. So I went in and I cut it. And it was pretty disorganized because like rehearsals in New York are hard to come by. And I trust my band, you know. And so I, I brought the music in and we did it. And I listened back and I was like, holy shit, this is fucking horrible. <laughs> it caused me so much anxiety. Not like that anyone's playing was horrible. It was just like this disorganized mess. And it was amplified by the fact that it was a mono mix, you know. And I was really, really, really taken aback. It was like a huge blow, you know. I just was like, wow, this is not good. And I had never really... You know, I've produced like some tracks and then some music and I did a, I produced a bunch of uh, Funny Fingers tracks with like all these guest singers, you know, that I'm still working on. And it was really great. And it was this awesome experience. And then I went in to do this and instrumental music is, can be a little bit more challenging. So when I listened, I was like, these songs does, it doesn't feel right. Nothing felt right. So I like revisited, I started to get into huge edits and I realized that like I had been trying to jam these songs into feels that they maybe were not the right feel. So I started to let myself, let the music tell me what it wanted. And then it ended up with like Bolero and like, you know, all these kind of feels that are not really like swing feels. And then another step further, as I kept writing, I was like, oh, I don't like these songs don't have to be about steel guitar. They don't have to be about me. They just are about creating this vibe, you know, not all, and not all. And I'm not saying that all music is like that because there's some music that's like, you know, guitar trio records or jazz quartets. Like that's about, that's about those people, you know? And I don't mean that in any sort of pejorative way. Like that's amazing. But this music that I had written was, this was not about it. And I didn't have to make this record about me. So, I did arrangements and I, you know, it's like six songs and a, and a vocal track, a song with the vocal, with a guest vocalist where I did like one version with steel guitar melody. And it's like, uh, and then one where we did the track and slightly edited and I had a great singer, Nick Hakim sing on it. And, uh, there was like some tunes I don't even play on, you know? And it's like, my record but i was like well i don't i don't need to play on this like this sounds like a big this kind of sounds like a small group you know there's horns on here like i don't have to jam steel guitar on here and it really freed me up you know i I was going to ask you that once you kind of realized that i bet you took a lot of pressure off you yeah 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 you know and there's i have like there's steel guitar moments for sure. There's a Hawaiian tune that I wrote many years ago that I finally got recorded. And, you know, and they, I do like a version of Skylark where I sing using like the pedal steel. That old song, the, Skylark? The, yeah, the Hoagie Carmichael tune. That's a pretty and song, man. It's a, it's a, one of my favorite songs. And I did, you know, and I played pedal steel on it, but I did it like a, a modern version of Pete Drake or something like that. Great. That's cool, man. And it's, what album? And that's, uh, that's the Exotica record. That's like uh, my. I, I like to call it. It's going to be two re- two EPs. I like to call it Honey Fingers: The Lost Tapes. Because <laughs> That's perfect. Actually, man. we haven't actually released anything, and I have like you know, I'm sitting on like a gold mine of stuff that I just can't get that last ten percent. That's you know? great, man. Well, just let me know, and I'll post it up because uh, I'd like to Thank check you. it out myself, man. So you've worked with some cool people. Let me throw some names out there, and maybe for each of these artists, if you could talk about. How you got the gig and maybe a cool or interesting or funny story about working with them. And let's start with David Byrne from the heads. Uh, well, like I said, it was with, uh, with Sin Cane. And so Sin Cane was the core band of the Atomic Bomb supergroup. And we played uh, Ahmed, the, uh, who is Sin Cane. He, he was asked to be the musical director of that project. And the the core band was Money Mark on keyboards, Sin Kane, which was Ahmed, uh, Mike Ish Montgomery on bass, and Jason J. Tram Trammell on drums. And we had Pat Mahoney from LCD Sound System who also played drums, so double drums. And we had uh, this amazing talking drum player from New York, Kofo, 
uh, the Wonder Man. What do you mean talking drums? Like like beatbox? No, like a African Nigerian drum that has a a head and it's tied on with ropes, and you can change pitch by tightening your grip on the ropes that are around the drum. And it's called a talking drum because they can make it sing. They can play pitches. Ah, okay, cool. It's incredible. So That's he cool. can sing on it. Like it's pretty amazing. Um, and then we had varying background singers, you know, but we've, so we would play the music of this, this, uh, amazing Nigerian recluse from this late seventies who William Onyebor, and he made this collection of records, you know, ultimately to make money because he was a businessman, but he somehow managed to create this like unique, incredible, joyous music, you know, music that I, we, you know, we spent three months in rehearsal. Wow. I, there was no way that I was getting on stage with David Byrne and I'm not going to, I want, we want, there were so many guests, you know, David Byrne and we got to play with Joshua Redman and Charles Lloyd and Farrell Sanders and M1 uh, Jamie Liddell, Alexis Taylor from Hot Chip, Damon Auburn from Gorillas and Blur, you know, there's no, and Dev Hines. There's no way that I would go into a situation like that. And they, they, the, all those singers needed to lean on us. And yeah. I didn't want us to not be a rock. So we spent a month of rehearsals as quartet. Then we spent another month of rehearsals with the second drummer and two weeks with money mark and that was the main band just getting these arrangements are very strange and eclectic mm. and so then we went into rehearsals with the guest singers for the first run of shows and you know we did like 40 hours of rehearsal in a week in london and then played you know two sh sold out shows at the barbican and went to bristol and played another sold out show and came to the u.s and did Two shows at BAM sold out, and the Warfield in San Francisco sold out. Very cool. The Greek. It was like an, an incredible experience. We got to play with the Lejadu sisters. I don't know if you know anything about them. No, no. What about They're who, these who identical they? twins from Nigeria as well, and they, they wrote amazing music. I, they were – they have some – they had some, a relationship with Ginger Baker – I think they were in the documentary. They Wait a minute. Up, the two twins had a relationship with Ginger Baker? Yeah. Oh, wow. They, That's like a Ginger Baker thing. Oh, identical yeah. twins? No, no. I mean, just like – Th that's not a, doesn't surprise me like that the guy had a relationship with twins like you know most normal people like i can't manage my one relationship you know and he's <laughs> he's got two two twins that's hysterical man um, yeah and like yeah and so they ended up having to leave nigeria because their music is very political they they have very strong beliefs and they had to they had to escape and they have asylum in in new york city and they're incredible there's very sweet and it's hard. They haven't had to see their family in many, many, many years is they're not a lot. They can't go back, you know? Uh, so I can't imagine what they're going. And, so, and how did yeah, da David get involved? Like what was his role in this? Was he the guy da spearheaded? Well, David, it or? David was one of the original owners of the Wakabop and they were going to re-release all of these records, you know, like a seven LP box set. Um, because I think these records go for like thousands of dollars, you know, like on the market and they're hard to get. And, um, so they, the Wakabop was re-releasing them and they wanted to put a, a band together to celebrate this. And gotcha. so we had this initial run and it went very well. And so then we just kind of kept doing it. And for the next couple of years, probably for three, I think the last one we played was last about a year ago in Italy, but before that, maybe 18 months, you know? So it's it's wound down now, but so David was involved, and David, you know, got, wanted to be one of the performers, and it was amazing working with him. His whole existence of how he uses, uh, how he's an artist, and I think he's an amazing role model, especially in uh, typical New York fashion, where his he's like he's the role model for using every resource that he has to help assist him create more art, writing books and doing theater shows and musicals and making records 
and making art and always being focused on that. And his whole, his whole uh, company is there in support to help him do that. And that's like an incredible, incredible thing, you know, man, he was so ever present as a kid growing up in New York city. You know, the heads were such a big presence God, yeah. Um, in the seven, you know, late seventies and the whole, you know, they really took, I guess, what, what would the word be back then? Indie music? Altern- I don't know what the word, what they called it back then, but he, you know, the heads were at the forefront of all of that stuff and, you know, him and, and I actually, um, I was really excited because I think, um, I think I'm getting Jerry Harrison on the show. So I was like, I found it this week. So I was like really stoked because you know that that's just awesome i want to just talk to the guy i just want to shut up and let him tell stories for like an hour <laughs> just <laughs> you know because those guys have done so much musically um busta rhymes what did you do with busta how'd you get involved and any funny stories um no funny stories i i got to play with uh this I got to meet this incredible singer, Jamie Liddell, through the Atomic Bomb Project. The, that that project really introduced me to a lot of different kinds of music and a lot of different kinds of people. And Jamie is this incredible, incredible singer. I know this is about Buster Rhymes, and I'll get there. But Buster Rhymes no, it's is, okay, an man. Do your thing. is an afternote to Jamie Liddell, who is like, I can't. You know, you know when like the drummers have someone like sing drum parts to them, and most drummers I know are like, I fucking hate that. <laughs> it's like the worst. It's like the worst. <laughs> okay, so I, I I ended up doing a couple shows with Jamie, and I went down for rehearsal, and I was going to play a little bit. Of, I was going to play mostly guitar and then play a little bit of pedal steel on the on like a ballad or something, and he. Is just like, can you do like this? And he would sing a lick and a long one, you know, because his references were like a uh, funkadelic, you know, and because uh, there's a little bit of pedal steel in some of those funkadelic records. Is there? And, yeah, I had no idea. I would have never thought that. Yeah, and so he's like, can you do like this? And he would sing like a two bar phrase. And I would listen and I'd be like, what the fuck? He's like singing me actual pedal steel licks, you know? I mean, he's an, he's incredible. He like is amazing. I can't speak highly enough of him. He is just like, and he's like become a great friend. And I think he's amazing, That's you know, cool, man. but he, so he, I, I, I got to play this show with him and, and, uh, one of his other friends, Alex Billowitz, was an amazing keyboard player lives in New York and uh was on the gig and we connected and one day he just was like hey are you like free tomorrow at like 11 and p.m and I was like yeah all right 11 p.m and I was like yeah sure and he goes okay cool let me just confirm uh let me see what time Busta is going to be in the studio and I was like what <laughs> I didn't ask, I didn't ask any questions I'm always just like yeah whatever you need I'll yeah. show up that's yeah, such a great, up. you know what? I've talked to so many people and like that is the standard way that great things happen to players. It's like they just want to play guitar or whatever it is they're doing and they want to show up and they got another gig. Great. You know, and it's with someone you like, it's a good vibe. Great. And then you go there and it's fucking like wild shit like Busta Rhymes or something. I mean, that's the... That's how the Nora, it's similar to how the Nora Jones, Billy Joe Armstrong connection happened, you know? So just to finish the Busta yeah, Rhymes yeah. things, it just was like, I roll to the studio in Midtown next to the M&M store. And oh, this is like, like right in Midtown, like Times oh, Square. Oh, it's fully Midtown. I mean, like all those great studios were in Midtown, you know? Mm. It has like a this beautiful wood igloo room that kind of, I think the same architect ended up building or working on the bunker studio in in brooklyn which is a great studio um they uh so i roll in there's no guitar i had to bring guitar amp you know there's just a piano in the room and i set up the the amp and i go into the control room and alex is like you know like busta usually comes in a little bit later let's just get started and we started working on the track and at some point, you know, comes in uh, later than eleven. 
because 11 is too early to be recording. <laughs> so then Alex That's is great. like, hold on. Hold on. <laughs> Here's Buster. He's calling me. And then he's like, yo, what, what? He's like, hey, Buster, what's going on? It's Alex. I'm here with my friend Johnny. And I said, I'll never forget it. I said, what up, Buster? And I, in my brain, I immediately went, wow. <laughs> never, I never thought I would ever, ever, ever say that. Yeah. And he was like, cool, you guys got the track, whatever. So we, you know, I spent like maybe 45 minutes working on this track with, with Alex and Busta comes and he comes in within two seconds of the track playing. He goes, what the fuck? This is too fast. You did it at the wrong fucking sample rate. <laughs> Not at like us, but he started to get into the engineer a bit, you know, which he should, you know, it's like the engineer's only job, like he right. didn't do his job. And so Busta just lit, lit him, lit him up. And Alex was like, that was mild, you know, that I was mean, you mild. Know, wow. We're all professional. Like we should be hold to high standards of just like doing our jobs. Like that dude is working a fucking session with Busta Rhymes, like do the right fucking sample rate. Dude, you know? I get it. Uh, it's like watching guys in the NFL, they're fucking receivers and like they never catch the ball. It's like, wait a minute. You, you have one job. Can you, I mean, but anyway, but yeah, I totally get it. I'm I'm all about <laughs> like being accountable, so that's cool. You know, so then we had to do it again slower, which was fine. And then you know, working with Busta was pretty. And watching him work and be like the what vibe he wanted is like he mo mostly while I was tracking, he sat in the other room on the phone with Easy Mo B, and and then when we finished, you know, it just was he came in and he just sat there and he moved all the little guitar parts and to exactly how he wanted them. And that was like incredible to watch him work, you know? Um, it was a great experience. And I have like a great picture with him where it looks like we're, I'm not sure how this pose happened, but it's like him and I next to each other and his hands are huge and we're like <laughs> clasping hands, but it just looks like we're going to prom. I'm going to prom with go to, uh, dude, dude, If you send me that, if you, dude. if you send me that photo, I will use it for this interview. Oh, it's I'm going to make a note here. That sounds, that sounds awesome. That sounds very classic. That's cool, man. So what, so this was a one track that you guys did with him? It was just like, uh, you know, Busta needed, they, you know, everyone is redoing samples. So I think, you know, they just, I just like redid some guitar stuff on a sample, Yeah. you know, so it's easier for them to get clearance, I guess. Very um, cool, man. Yeah. What time did that session end? It wasn't that, it wasn't very long, maybe like one o'clock in the morning or something oh, like that. That's not bad. You know, which is very late for me, but. Oh, it's, you know. yeah, it's late, but two hours with Buster, that's probably not bad at all. Yeah, it was all right. It was a good time. Um, then you Ubered back to Brooklyn? Uh, well, I think it was like a weeknight and in Midtown on the weeknight late, you can find street parking everywhere because all the street regulations uh, is up. Oh, really? I, I had to bring an amp, so I had to drive. So I was just planning on like, oh, I'll just get in, I'll just park in a lot. But then I was like, oh, there's like street parking everywhere. That's great. So I just park in the street. For all these people listening that don't live in New York City, Midtown is the ground zero for a million people. And it's basically impossible to find parking on the street. And But apparently at nighttime, it's all right. So. Yeah. This is so funny. So we're coming up to the city in, in like I said, end of October. And I was <laughs> I was just looking at the parking rates for the hotel. Holy shit. It's insane. <laughs> it was something like six hundred dollars if you own a park it for four days. I was gonna believe you can rent a fucking Airbnb <laughs> for for a week probably with that. I mean Dude, you just gotta like drop everyone off in the city and then like go drive into Brooklyn and it, it, just like park it on the street and then just like move it every two days and, and then you know, it's crazy. Well, even like when I lived in the Bronx, it was like a pain in the ass because, and you know, they had. I'm sure they still have every other day. You know, the yeah, the street cleaning. God, that was such a pain in the ass, man. And you like, if you had a day off, you nope, you're up, your ass is up at seven to move that vehicle. Well, the thing about certain you know neighborhoods that are residential, like in the Bronx, is that after six p.m. Nah, I'm sorry, you're not finding a parking spot. No, because everyone's in for the night. You know, so but there are neighborhoods that are a lot of in transit people so you know where it's easy to find parking at all hours but man midtown manhattan is not one of them oh hell yeah that's great that you got a spot man <laughs> i don't know why i asked you that. i just thought I, I was just curious about that oh uh, man when anytime there's something in midtown it's like a huge it's alarm a, yeah it's a headache yeah 
How about Billy Joe Armstrong? Uh, well, th- like I was saying, and uh, with you know how I ended up working with Busta because I was working with Jamie. I had been playing with Jason Laughlin, who you did, I think. Yeah, an interview I interviewed. His interview comes out tomorrow. Yeah, yeah. Great guitar player, great yeah. musician. Um, Luca and I had been playing in his Western swing band, the String Gliders. Yeah. And uh, started to play with this bass player, Tim Lunsell, who you know, passed away last yeah. year. Sorry about uh, that. Amazing, amazing, incredible, incredible musician. He played in Camp- Campy's Trio, the original incarnation of the trio in New York that played at the old knitting the, – the tap room in, at the knitting factory. You can still like smoke there. It was this weird concrete really? box. Yeah, this was – you know. I, I remember going to shows there. You could there was like a weird little smoking room, and that is weird. Um, so I started playing with Tim a lot, and you know we became very close. And one day I was outside of Fleischer's Meats on Fifth Avenue in Park Slope, and I got a phone call from Tim, and I was like, "Hell yeah!" So I answered, and I was like, "What's up?" And the other voice said, "Hi, Johnny. This is Nora." I just wanted to see if you were around on Friday. And it was like Wednesday. And I was like, <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> you know, I was like, uh, yeah, yeah, whatever you want, you know. Yeah. Uh, this was like a amazing, you know, I'll never forget this moment. Um, and it, it's like a, Tim was such a connector. It's like indicative of like what a wonderful person he was. And I know that that moment in the studio, Nora was like, maybe – uh, we can get some pedal steel on some of these tracks. And Tim was like, I got the guy for you. And he had been kind of hinting at this a little bit. He like made sure he had my phone number a couple of days before. And then I know that that moment happened. And he said, I got the perfect person and dialed it and handed it to Nora. You That's know? so and, cool. And uh, I never talked to him about that other than like thanking him profusely. And, you know, now that he's gone, it's like a huge honor that I got to be on a record that's like just him, Dan Reeser, who's an amazing drummer, Charlie Burnham, who's an amazing musician, amazing violin player and mandolin singer. Like he is like a fucking New York legend, you know, and he's a legend uh, and Nora and Billy Joe. And that's like a pretty crazy thing. You know, it's like six people on a record. It's pretty, pretty awesome and special. Yeah. So that's how I ended up getting that, and I went over there. I didn't really know what was happening, and so I just kind of went there, and Nora was there. She she was very nice, and then, you know, up from the downstairs of the magic shop, uh, Billy Joe comes, and I was like, oh, <laughs> weird. <laughs> All right. Yeah. I, I, I ask a lot of questions, but, uh, you know, sometimes I just don't ask like, anyway, you, know, you can't really like, say, what are you doing here? <laughs> yeah. But also yeah. afterwards, not, I don't forget if it was after or during Billy had like left to go work on something downstairs. And I was just like looking at the guitar rack and I just like pick up a telly and then noodling on it. And I'm like, oh, pretty cool. And I pick up like this Les Paul June, Les Paul special double cut. And then the guy looks at me and he goes, pretty cool. Right. And I was like, what do you mean? And he goes like, that's like a 52 Esquire, and that's like a wow. 56 Special. And these things look fucking perfect. That's and I was amazing, like, oh, man. cool. You know, they looked like they, – they, they were like American standards. They were so shiny and beautiful, you know? And I was like, oh, cool. And then I just like – I was like, I'll just like put 20000 fifty thousand dollars worth of guitar back yeah yeah you know, gently i'm like yeah i'm like standing and playing them too i mean you know like I'm, no one stands and plays guitar and then like fucking drops it you know but i was like uh, i'll just like put those away that's cool man you know what? i think i've interviewed every guitar player Nora jones and she's had like 40 guitar <laughs> players I've had, yeah. like i've had so many guys that have played with nora it's it's really funny she's been well i think she's been with her current band for a couple of years yeah, I know I had Adam Levy played with her and Campolongo, loads of people, man. Amazing. Um, what are you working on now that you're excited about? Um, well, I finished that Exotica record, which was, I, it's like maybe 22 minutes of music, 
but 20, I guess it would be 26 because I did the one song twice. Um, and oh, there's like 20. Wait, wait, four. What was the deal with that? You did one song twice. Well, I did one song uh, as an instrumental with the steel playing the melody. And then I did that. Uh, right. Okay. I took that track and I broke it down and then I had a friend sing on it. So it's basically the same track with just different melody. Um, that's, kinda, has, that's actually pretty cool. Well, you know, I just thought mm. doing this project and playing all these melodies on steel, it just was like a fun thing. And I, and I thought it would just like a good fit for, for Nick to sing this song. You know, I can't tell you how much I have been inspired by comments like that over the last, you know, 14, 15 months that I've been doing this by, you know, musicians are some of the only people that do that. Like I thought it would be fun. And so, and you know, it really got me thinking like, why don't I do that? Like, you know, why doesn't everybody do that? Because it seems like, fuck man, you get one trip here. You get one spin around this, this earth, right? Like, why shouldn't that be a very significant portion of a decision making factor in, in the things you do? And and I've been really inspired by that because I've heard that so many times and it's really rubbed off on me. So I think that's great that you did that. As musicians, especially in New York, we're a, an impoverished crew. And at the end of the day, um, what do you, what do you, what do you have? You have the things that you care about and that you cared about mm -hmm. and the things that you did your very best to be yourself you know, and that's how you hopefully have contributed to music. Yeah. You know, there's almost no hope to find work and like, what are you going? Th and this is a realization I ended up with this year. And, and I, um, what do I, if I can't contribute in a way that, that I can't be myself and I can't be the best person that I can be, it's not good for the music and it's not good for me. Yeah. Most important. It's not good. For so you. if, if I can just keep doing things that are like, well, that'll be fun. I'll just go for that, you know? And that doesn't mean to not be responsible or not to honor the music that you're playing. Um, this is another thing that's, I learned from Sincane, which is a similar thing from pedal steel is that in Sincane, I play so many of the, main riffs in unison with the bass and i'm beholden to that and as like a guy who played in like pre at points a lot of pretty loose bands where you're like just do whatever just do your thing you know i ref my brain refused to organize in a way or like build it it was so hard to see the music holistically when it's just like you're connecting chord to chord and you're working on a, on a level of from bar to bar but then when you start working in a, in a music where when if you make you have to get to the chorus you know it's not like just getting to the four chord you, you have to play the part that gets you to the chorus and so by playing in syncane and being so restricted inevitably because i kind of have a uh kind of got a lot of personality sh shit squeaks out and the shit that squeaks out is the stuff that you're feeling or you're hearing. And I, as we just kept doing this in Sincane, and I honestly, I didn't really love this music when I first started playing it. I just was doing it. And I loved Ahmed and I loved Ish and I loved J Tram and like being around those guys was amazing and making music with them and experiencing all these things was so incredible. Um, and there's not a time I play that music that it's not more fun and better than the last time I played that music. And this is like something that's important to me because I can be myself while also honoring Ahmed's vision. Hmm. And the more you do it, the more you cultivate and develop your own personal sound. You know, it's like, but Ahmed gave me the framework to be able to start doing that. But if I'm playing in this and this path is not for everyone. This has just happened for me. If I play in a million bands, kind of lose myself to the music rather than 
let my find myself in that music but by playing the same songs for many years and working on that i really have found myself you know i feel that's great that, yeah and i did that answer that question i now I, sometimes i get on these tangents no I, no it's this is fine this is like the tangent show so it's all good it doesn't matter it, it, you answered it because you were being sincere yes you answered it you know it's all like you know what more can we the question is less important than your reaction to the question sort of yeah but know? if there was a question i i think i'm pretty sure that that related to the question <laughs> but i can't remember anymore there's no right or wrong it's not like the question was you know what is three plus three you know yeah but if someone is listening to this and the question is like what's one plus one and i'm like well, one plus one let me tell you and i love apple and, <laughs> that's and, okay uh, man anyway. it's okay man everybody's a musician listening to this so they dig it it's all good <laughs> Um, now what um now i lost my train of thought which is really bad uh i i think it's so cool though that you are not doing like i'm gonna say quote conventional stuff and you're a really busy guy and and to have found all these things that you like whether you like them day one or whether you learned something from them, grew as a person, as a musician, and then started liking it and, and getting a value out of it and giving. I think it's great because you're, I mean, you are so busy and you got so many projects going on then. So. Um, this year, in terms of like prioritizing projects, this year has been like eye opening and pretty incredible for me. I finished that exotica record i because like finishing the last i probably have 30 plus tracks that are like 90 percent complete that i just fucking don't know how to finish and that was why i wanted to do this exotica record and i why i wanted to include i mean there's five guitar players on this record it's like um luca is playing jason laughlin's playing this amazing jazz guitar player nate radley it's playing rich rich hinman plays on it i wanted to like include as many people that i that was important to me, you know, to not make it an insular process. Um, there was a moment this year where someone asked me to play pedal steel for them. And they were like, really, they were very excited, apparently. And they were like, oh, man, I would really love for you to play pedal steel with me. I'm coming to New York, do some shows. And, um, and I was like, okay, cool, you know, hit me up. So they, they hit me up and we have a conversation about pay and I understand that it's very difficult for people to come up with money and we agree on something and then I, he kind of disappears. And then two days later, he's like, I'm sorry. Uh, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm glad you can do it, but I found someone in town who can do it for free and we can rehearse at his house. And I, was like, <laughs> and I was like, okay, that's fine, you know? And then that's amazing. the day of the show, I get an email that says, hey, it didn't work out with that guy. Shocking. Because, because of course it didn't. Can you still do it? And I had a moment where I was like, well, what, do you, what, do you, what did you want? Did you just want a guy to fill a warm seat? Or do you want me, you know? Because I believe... I can contribute in my own special way as, as musicians, we all should feel that way. And I was like, I, and I just, and I, I never wanted to feel like an afterthought, you know, because as, as side men, we are in service to the songwriter. And I really try to believe very strongly in that. And I haven't always been as respectful. And so, but that respect is a two way street. Absolutely, man. And so I ended up turning the gig down. Um, and then I had went into a deep, deep thoughts of like, well, what am I doing? I really didn't like that feeling. And it wasn't about like my ego. It just was like, we get paid so little to do this. I just wanted to do things that I believe in and I think are fun. Back to the fun thing. That yeah. was what that conversation was about. And so I was like, what am I waiting for in New York? What am I, what am I doing? Um, and I mostly am playing in bands that I love with 
great friends of mine and having a really good time. You know, I play in the string gliders. You know, Jason's band has like afforded me to like forge my own like personal strange Western swing steel guitar Jerry Bird identity, which I love. That's like the the mentally something I love playing lap steel. It's an incredible, incredible challenge. And the almost exact opposite of pedal steel, where stylistically, while it it's there for you, a certain tunings, like a, the C6 tuning, it has that Hawaiian sound. But if you don't want that Hawaiian sound, you're fucked. You <laughs> know what to do, because if you are casual about it, you will sound like you don't want a sound. So you have to be aware of a lot of things in a slightly different way than pedal steel. Pedal steel is like a machine that is doing country music sounds for you. The lap steel musically is more limitless. And so by playing, you know, unless you're playing Hawaiian music and then, you know, it's there for you. It's great. If all you want to do is play Hawaiian music, it's amazing. But, you know, Jason afforded me that and I played in this Emmy Lou band, you know, north of Amarillo and we got to like play all these tunes that are amazing. And I was like, well, what am I waiting for? Am I waiting for someone to call me and say, hey, can you play three sets of like 50 tunes that you do, probably won't know that well and you just won't do a good job as you would like to do? And and I was like, no, I'm really happy in Syncane and I'm really proud of it and I want everything to be like that. So then, uh, you know, my year has been was is culminating in a concert of music that I had been working on for the last year and a half. And I had that to look forward to and that I had been working on. And I said, well, I'm going to just do this and I'm going to go for I'm going to work as hard as I can in Syncane because we're working on a new record and I'm going to work on my music extremely hard and I'm going to play with my friends and I'm going to have a great time. I'm not going to like, I'm not like taking myself off the market, but I'm going to be a little bit more selective about the projects I choose and why I choose them. And then of course I get an email from Rich Hinman who says, hello, recommended you for a gig. You're going to get a phone call today. And then that gig was with a major touring artist and with, you know, it was like a three minute conversation that said, Hey, rehearsal start here. And that was the week of my concert. And this is like, this is all happening within a one week time frame of me, you know, losing my gig to a, a pedal steel player who will do it for free. For free. Yeah. You know what though? My own identity. You know what? In that case, just to cut before you get to the other thing, yeah, yeah. you know what I do in business? I have this thing called the asshole tax. Yep. I'm serious. And when I you get you. when you get someone like that, you get the fucking asshole tax. So if I charge X, I now charge one and a half X or two X because that guy is an asshole. And it's just the triangle of like wh- what does this mean to you? So is it good music? Are there good friends? Is the money good? Right. That, it has to be 180 degrees, you know, like and and you can choose what boundaries you want, you know. And so I talk with the manager. And they're like, it's like a 12, 18 month commitment. And this is literally the dream of mine from when I first started playing pedal steel, you know, things change. And the first rehearsal started the week of my concert of my music for the first, you know, I've never done that before, written music and performed a concert. That's all my music, you know. And I just said, well, that's like literally the only non-movable date of the entire year, you know. And that was the end of the conversation. Wow. And, uh, you know, you know, I could have got to play the beacon and all these great places and it probably would have been a lot of fun. But at the end of the day, you know, I'm going to finish this year and I'm going to have made three records that I'm really proud of and I will have put a lot of energy into them. And that is valuable to me right now, yeah. you know. Good for you, man. And that doesn't mean that opportunity won't come around again or another similar opportunity. You I know? mean, you know, things you never- are things are things are good for me now with Syncane and with this group of people and you know, I'm I can't be more proud of that stuff that you know that I'm doing and and I'm really lucky and to be honest, like my older brother has done very well for himself and he recently sold his company and he believes in art and i'm not like he doesn't just sit and give me resources but 
his support of just saying, you have to just keep doing what you're doing because that's important. That's you great. Know? It's not about, um, this is a luxurious statement and a privileged statement, you know, but because I'm there, it means that I have an even greater responsibility to honor myself and what I do musically. So he says, whatever, you know, if you ever need help, I have like a huge trampoline or what a safety net, not a trampoline. I don't know why that came. I, I watch too many internet videos of kids falling off trampolines, <laughs> um, you know, and so I want to honor that and I want to honor myself, you know, and I think that's really important. And man, you know what? Sometimes life just happens. It, it, it wouldn't have been any different if you were having a baby that week. It just happened to be it wasn't a baby. It was a musical baby. Yeah, exactly. You know? And so that's that's it. End of conversation, man. Life happens, man. And and this is the whole, you know, throughout your whole life, you get opportunities and you question them. Should I do them? Should I not do them? That's going to, this is a constant ongoing thing. And this time it wasn't fit, man. So um, where are you originally from? Uh, I was born in New York and raised in northern New Jersey. My I'm still bitter at my parents for selling their limestone building on 106th and Riverside. Oh, my God. Well, you know, in the 70s. Oh, yeah. 106th and Riverside was a little dodgy. <laughs> it was, it was a little, they got broken into too many times with my older brother, and they yeah. got they, – they, they left for the suburbs, you know. But, I yeah. Exactly I, where I always just vis- envision myself in New York City um, as a reality – not even as a dream just like when i grow up you just move to new york and it wasn't until i was an adult and i first moved to brooklyn and i had been living uptown like way uptown like well you know basically the bronx i live by the university at bridge i live like 186 and uh, laurel terrace which is like the last street like i was looking on the east river you know it's like is that lexington up there or lafayette lexington you know, like right by Yeshiva University. I could yeah. like see the University Avenue Bridge. And um, and I moved to Brooklyn and I, after a decision of wanting to live by my friends rather than live by my work, because I still taught a lot of guitar lessons in New Jersey. And so, you know, Y86 was a great in-between. But just doing anything was a little bit difficult to get downtown. And I moved to Brooklyn and I was like, oh, I'm, I re- distinctly remember this feeling of, of going, I'm home. And my, one of my best friends and oldest friends, I've known him, our parents have known each other, I've known him for my enti- literally my entire life. Our parents were friends in the you know, 70s. Um, they, they lived in uh, Carroll Gardens. You Queens. Know, uh, in Brooklyn. Okay. Like, like by Red Hook, by, uh, you know, by... Uh, I know no, nothing about Brooklyn. Brooklyn, like when I grew up, was just like. Oh, the, you don't go there. No, it was the same misery as the Bronx, except on the other side of the D train. I'm like, I got all this mess fucking here. Why do I need to go travel a, an hour and 15 minutes on the D train to go see the same shit over there? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so I, I just was like, oh, I'm, I'm home. Like the feeling that I had was. That's cool, man. Adult. And then, you know, getting a little bit older, that was in my, my 20s, and and realizing that. Oh, my older brother and my younger brother, three boys, God bless my mother, yeah. and uh, they never really wanted to be here. My older brother went to school in Boston and then moved to California, and my younger brother went to school in New Jersey at Rutgers, and then he just moved to California, you know? And now he's back, but it was it's, it was always just like a dream of mine, or like, it wasn't even a dream, it just was like, what i was going to do i was destined to be here you know my mom grew up here you know and my grandparents were here and my great-grandparents were here you know um so it was like just following the you know it's fun to like drive around the east the lower east side with my mom who would be like oh yeah that's like where i got mugged you know my mom came to school in the lower that has changed so much that area i remember that library you know and yeah that neighborhood has really changed a lot. So, well, it's funny. Like in the seventies and sixties, the Bowery was like Skid Row. It was still Skid Row even ten years ago. It might there's still spots that are like Skid Row now? You know, it's amazing, man. And now all these shishi places down there boggles my mind every time it's I'm like, there. It's, yeah, it's a lot. New York City is is a 
is a lot right now. No, oh, it's you crazy. Know, like, or like, no. So, what was your childhood like growing up? Sounds pretty, pretty normal, pretty healthy. Yeah, I just, you know, played sports, took piano lessons. You know, like it, it, it was. Uh, yeah, I grew up in a in a small town next to Hackensack. Like, you know, uh, uh, not very, not a very diverse town. Mm. Um, yeah. And then, but very close. Like I could get into the New York, I can get into mid and port authority, which is, was terrifying. Yeah. Was back in the day. Holy shit. Yeah. And it's still a terrifying place to me. <laughs> it's still the most terrifying place to me in New York. Really? Port authority? I you just don't, there's just like so much people in transit. There's like, there's like homeless people everywhere. And it just is like, embodies my childhood like personal space sensory alarm <laughs> and it still does really yeah it's, yeah. it's cleaned up a lot man I, oh it's cleaned up so yeah. much but just like everyone around like in you know it's like the the montage of like the kid like entering a family you know from the kid's point of view like entering a family thing and like aunties are squeezing his cheeks and like <laughs> how's it going yeah, you know, yeah telling the same jokes for 10 years like <laughs> that's what it feels like when i go to the port authority people handing out samples and like a million people going somewhere in a rush and ah uh, yeah yeah that's funny man i never I, the only time i get like that on high alert is like if i'm with I mean, I'm always sort of on high alert, but like, I remember one time we were in the city and my daughter, it was her birthday and she wanted to go to, to see the cake boss mm -hmm. in Jersey. So we had to go to the Port Authority and take a freaking bus. Just so like to, Union City, right? Or we walk in? It, no, it's, um, it, it wasn't, it's like 20 minutes. It was, uh, shit. I can't remember the name of the town, but that it, it was, it was Freaking in December, it was ice cold, and you get to the fucking cake boss, and the only reason you know is because four blocks away, the line. Lo and I'm like, you've got to be kidding me. What are you going to do here? And oh, I just, it's a bakery. I, I mean, there's like a hundred bakeries we just left that have really good shit, and you don't have to wait. So we just sat there freezing and to get a picture of her with the cake boss's sister, I think, or something like that. But, you know, she's a little girl, but whatever that was. But I, then I was on high alert because I got my wife and my daughter. My wife is from a small, small town in the UK. Like, I don't think she saw anybody that wasn't like white Anglo-Saxon Protestant probably until she was like in high school. And, and my daughter, who's like 70 pounds soaking wet at that time. So it was, I'm on like, <laughs> you know. Uh, what, what kind of jobs did your folks uh, do? My mom was a fashion designer. Wow, my that's dad awesome. was an electrical engineer. He worked for Hewlett Packard. So, did you get your like creative flair from your mom? My, I'm really, really, really lucky, and uh, my 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 parents always encouraged me to do whatever I wanted to do. Um, they and all of my brothers are in creative. My older brother is a writer, journalist, and then my younger brother is a furniture maker, and he also builds. He went to school to design sets. Uh, he, you know, he loves art. That's great. Um, and it's from our parents. We all went to Montessori school. Man, that is which. Which I know a lot of people that did and. It doesn't necessarily prepare you for real life, but it prepares you for it, – it, it's like the way that – I'm really lucky. I, I, I learned how to learn very young. I learned how I learned. I never could deal with public school. Like I, the first day at class in second grade in Mrs. Young's class, she said, spelling test. And man, well, I, for people who don't know, Montessori school is a – is a type of learning started by a woman from Italy, I think. And you basically are taught the tools to learn. And I remember just sitting there. No one tells you what to do. You just go to this thing. And I remember sitting and completing math notebooks by myself because it was fun, you know. And I went to public school and I sat down in Mrs. Young's class 
who I found out much later was Jehovah's Witness, but I never knew that. Like all these things that just like go over your head. Yeah. I don't know why that even matters. It doesn't. Did she, she did she said, did she knock on your door in the evening? No, but someone said to me later in life, do you know did you remember Mrs. Young was Jehovah's Witness? And and I was like, No. And yeah, she would leave the room when people would celebrate their birthday and she wasn't oh, there wow. for the holidays. You know? Interesting. Anyway, she was a gr- she was a nice teacher, but so the spelling test, the first word she goes train, and I just raised my hand and I just said T R A I N, you know? I remember this. And then the whole class burst out laughing. And I was like, what the fuck are we doing? <laughs> what the fuck is this? <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. That's hilarious, man. But fast forward to like uh, you know, <laughs> I took guitar lessons from Vic Juris, who's a New York. Oh City my god. So what a great player. He's legend. a monster. Yeah. And he is an unbelievable monster. And I was really, really lucky to have a couple of really great teachers and part of his thing was that he, I would show up and he would be like I remember working on autumn leaves with him and I listened to like blues guitar players growing up you know I love the blues I love BB King I love Freddie King and I, I love the three kings and I you know like I listened to tons of Stevie Ray Vaughan and Eric Clapton and I loved I love that stuff so I remember two things with him was he would just I would show up and he would go write a chorus and so i would show up two weeks later and i will have written a solo out and that's still basically how i practice i like write things out I like work on rhythm changes you know this is part of how all this music got written last year is that i would be on tour and i would wake up two hours before van call and i would sit and i would write out i would try to write eight bars every day of something you know just any working on specific things or working on anything, you know, and so it would take like a couple of days to like write a whole chorus and then I would learn it and then, you know, move on to the next. It was not really about memorizing it. It was kind of about being in touch with my musical ear and my musical brain. And so this is brings me back to like how I learned in Montessori that was kind of at my own pace, but like a distillation of what I wanted to express. And I, there's things that I write that just don't come into my playing, you know, but that's fine. That's not what there it's kind of about. It's just kind of like about tickling my own ear and through awakening my inner ear more that it really helped me in the writing process. Uh, I have had a bunch of buddies over the years who sent their kids to Montessori and all of them are super creative. And yeah. It's a really good school for that to develop your creativity, man. Um, if you could have gone back, Johnny, and like giving yourself advice or giving younger Johnny Lamb advice, what would you have, what advice would you have heard that would have made your life easier in some way, either professionally or, or personally? Um, I don't, I don't know. I, I, I just, I get my life is kind of like, Every day I feel like is the best day. That's you awesome. know, it's great. And I, it does, it's not like a blindness, but I always feel, you know, I always I feel always working towards something. And there are so many things now that are coming to realization in my brain that I learned twenty years ago. And I don't know if anything I could have said to myself younger other than you're different, you know, like you find your own path. But I, it wouldn't have meant anything to me, you know, sure. so more than going back and saying is it would it's I don't know if this is dodging the question, but it feels like I don't know if younger self would have been able to absorb any information, you know, but I do sometimes say I wish I could just go back in time and beat the shit out of like my 12 year old self and just be like, you know, just <laughs> just go crazy. Enjoy life. You're young. Have a great time. Other than like the cliche shit, you know, yeah, like, yeah. stop worrying, stop worrying so much, you know. Yeah. Go to the doctor. Migraines every day after school and throwing up for two years of your life is not normal. Yeah, man. Well, I'm glad you're not still doing that. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
Let's talk about gear for a few minutes. I know nothing about oh, pedal steel oh, at all. So if we can keep it to like electric, well, though I will ask you one pedal steel question because I got a lot of listeners. Oh, I, if you, we can do another, we can do another uh, two hours. In gear. <laughs> Let's go. What's your favorite, what's your go-to guitar right now? And what other two guitars of yours would round out your top three? Not for sessions. I mean, the guitars you go to grab that you like. Okay. Uh, I have a lot of guitars. I, you know, I have a reasonable amount of guitars. I view guitars as tools. Yeah. Like I don't own two strats. I own a strat, you know, like because a strat does a certain thing. I don't necessarily, I believe that there are special guitars, but I think inherent in the design of guitars, they inspire you differently. So I like having lots of different guitars. That being said, I, I recently within the last like three years acquired uh, a 1950 Epiphone Emperor region, which so, is what is that? It's like Epiphone's highest guitar, highest model guitar to compete with the Super 400. It's like uh, the Gibson Super 400, which is like an 18 inch bout. It's like an 18 and a half inch bout guitar with a super deep cutaway, like a 19 fret cutaway. That was like Epiphone's top of the line guitar. And it was always – there's just something always about Epiphone guitars I've been drawn to. And this was a guitar that I never, ever, ever, ever thought I would own. But I found it on Craigslist in New Jersey. And it had been there for a while. And the pictures were pretty bad. I'm going to look it up while you're talking because I want to see what this thing looks like. Sorry. Go ahead. And I met him at a guitar center early in the morning. And uh, I was the only one in the parking lot excuse me um and i see this old toyota camry roll up like the square ones from the 80s <laughs> like the 80s, a small one the small one the, yeah. oh, this is a nice guitar man this is like an old jazz box yeah it's a arch, arch, great arch top it's the king of arch tops like, for me and i was like oh that's the guy and i was like this guitar is worth more than that car you know so I go over there and we talk and I end up buying it from him. And the guitar is a fucking basket case, you know. It is owned by his childhood friend's father, who was a country music singer in New, in New Jersey. His name was Fred Hughes. Um, and it had gotten the shit played out of it. Uh, there's like overspray, got like spray painted black kind of. Like someone tried to like refinish it. It was a pretty fucked up guitar that was coming apart. The top was off and i brought it to my repair guy um who's my favorite repair guy of all time and he's gonna leave in like a year or two to move down to north carolina to be with his daughter which i get but i'm pissed <laughs> he refrets all my guitars and i can't you know alan watsky new jersey that guy fucking rules just That's someone who big someone guitar who cares who someone who cares and is technical and is neurotic and also plays. And I think it's like the perfect balance for a repair guy because sometimes I've had experience with repair people in New York where the overhead is really difficult, where they don't want to work on things that they don't like or or they don't do a good job on the things that they don't think are special. And I don't have time for that or money to waste on that. Yeah, because it's yeah. all special to you if you bring in a guitar, man. Yeah. Well, the thing that I learned from Alan is started refretting guitars for me is like what the way that you know just the way that he does it i'm just really into so anyway alan had to basically totally disassemble this guitar the neck was coming off needed to be re-glued he had to rebind some of the stuff he the back was totally off i've seen the inside of my guitar i've like held the top of my guitar you know it's incredible like it's a big hands. thick guitar isn't it i mean yeah it's like a, you know three inches it's like an arch top you know mm. but like holding the top that someone had carved you know, is incredible that guitar and i have a, a lap steel guitar by todd kleinsmith which is cast aluminum um that that lap steel and not because it's a lap steel but because i just think it's one of my favorite instruments like you know i guess i gauge my instruments on how they and how much they inspire me and then and then i have a melody maker like a 61 melody maker that I got off eBay many years ago as a basket case. And I had 
I had someone put a P90 in it and put a different bridge on it, and they actually did a really shitty job. <laughs> and and that was the first guitar I had brought to Alan, and he refretted it, and he totally transformed the guitar, and it's just like this little monster, and I really like it. What is That's that? Sa- is that like a sound like an old Gibson? It's what does that sound? An like? old Gibson melody maker. Yeah, yeah. You know, very cool, man. Um, name a couple of players that you've really, if you've played, I don't know if you've played a lot of other guitars, but it sounds like you have because you're through the pedal steel. Name a couple of guitars you've really enjoyed jamming with, and then is there other couple that you'd like to jam with? Um, the guitar players who all played on my record are all, I, I asked them because they were all really special to me. Like Luca, it, you know, he was, the Honey Finger started as like I played pedal steel and we were just like trying to play two 45 minute sets. And that's hard to do instrumentally. Mm-hmm. The gig didn't pay very much. And I would do it trio with a bass player. You know, without a drummer is really difficult. And Luca was the guitar player and we played so much music together. You know, there was a point where we would be playing and we would i playing i'm playing pedal steel and he's playing guitar and we play the exact same thing holy shit that's pretty cool that- and we would look at each other and just go same you know like it happened in, it happened a lot you know and so you guys just had a very good vibe i just like i think he's i think he's so great um nice. and then jason Walkman, who played on the exotic record as well i mean uh he i just like respect him so much as like this as a band leader and like his vision and the way that he chases his his visions i think he's such a he like can focus in on like these minute details of of things and really incorporate them into his playing and and i'm always will be always grateful to him for the amount that we got to play and like as like Western swing kids basically and like grow up together, you know, playing that kind of stuff, which was his music, you know, a lot of his music and arrangements that he would bring in. And, you know, I got to meet Tim Lunzel through him who's still, you know, I said before, but is like was such a special person in my life. Mm. Um, and Andy Borger, who's an incredible drummer. Um, so Jason and Nate Radley, who played on the record also, who's an inspiration, just like he's such an amazing guitar player. And we have such great talks about what music means to us. And this like weird journey of his own personal journey of like jazz guitar, which is really difficult. And, you know, sonically, what, what is jazz guitar? That's like a really, really hard question, you know, because what are you going to do? Like turn your, all the sounds that I've been spoken for. (laughs) <laughs> yeah. you know so it, it's like a not a very sonically diverse thing and when i made the record earlier this year the one of the hardest conversations was what guitar sound is going to identify this and i had to avoid like beautiful guitar sound because then you get into frizzell territory you had to view, avoid muted clean guitar sound because then you're just in straight up cliche jazz guitar territory you know like it's such an identity sonically that it, it it was a hard thing. And so it's great to talk with Nate about those kind of things. And, you know, Rich Hinman, who was like my idol, he's, he was the first guy in New York that doubled on that. I knew that was like a great pedal steel player and a great guitar player. And he sounds like himself on both. Like he sound, when I hear him play guitar, I can recognize him and he plays those same things on pedal steel and he's incredible. And, you know, yeah, I guess. I, and then I, those are the guitar players that I off the top of my head right mm. now that I like, I really respect and love. And I guess, of course it was like a huge honor for Jim to ask honey fingers to like back him up, mm. you know, this is such a cool thing. And Jim, Jim is so incredible because he has mindlessly and mindfully forged his own personal identity. 
on on guitar, which is really, really, really difficult. Mm. You know, um, and in terms of guitar players, I'd love to play with. Uh, I would love to play with Bill Frizzell, I think, and Greg Lees. You know, those those guys are the. Greg was the one of the first times I had heard pedal steel. I didn't even know what it was, and it was on a Bill Frizzell record. Um, it took me a really long time even playing to go oh shit that was pedal steel you know and then i went back to revisit it and i was like oh yeah it is you know that was kind of a cool thing and i just like love frizzell's sense of melody and his uniqueness um and i would love to play with mark rebo you know that i love guitar players so I would love to play with all of them. <laughs> That's, I love guitar players. That's cool, man. I like that. I love guitar. That's why I play it. You yeah. Know? Everyone loves guitar. <laughs> yeah. Everyone loves guitar. Although sometimes I really fucking hate steel guitar. It pisses me off. <laughs> guitar, I, I've, I'm, I'm currently in a love affair with guitar, not steel guitar, but it's only one or the other. I can't love both. That's so. all right, man. Hey, Desert Island Discs, top three. No, no particular order, knowing this could change tomorrow. Just for that uh, last minute. Oh man, let me think. Ka- kind of blue, Miles Davis, right? Mm-hmm. Yep. Um, Hank Mobley, Soul Station, and. Grant Green, Sonny Clark Quartets. Interesting. Man, I, I don't know why I don't hear Grant. No, you, know, you you set that question up in a nice way that's like it can change any any time. And so that's I just like tried to think of records yeah. that I loved and where I am right now. Yeah, because and I don't think I've listened to either one of those records any of those records in so long, you know. I'm listening to like tons of Mahavishnu and Joni Mitchell now. But like those records are ones that I, I tried to just think about what records give me a good feeling and I can remember the whole record. Yeah. And those three records for sure. I'm surprised I don't hear more Grant Green. It's Manimal. He's the best. Tough question, man. What do you like most about yourself, Johnny? Oh, do do you know Adam's, I had the best answer for this. Do you know who Adam Zimmon is? I don't know. Adam is in uh, LA. He plays with Ziggy Marley. Very (laughs) hilarious. I mean, fucking hilarious guy. I, I asked him this question. He goes, how can I answer that question when I have so much self-loathing? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that was classic. <laughs> True. The funniest answer that I've ever heard. Like such, such as t- an artist answer, you know, a particularly musician. Huh. God. I don't know, man. <laughs> I, I have to I, – I, I don't know. Come on. You got to come up with an answer for that one. I, I think that I have – I think that I have a, a positive energy and I like to think that I can bring that to people and they can understand that. I'm always very encouraging and, you know, I think I think that's a – you answered it. That's good. Yeah. Pass. Uh, if you didn't become a, a professional Fuck musician, you. <laughs> <laughs> if you didn't become a professional musician, what do you think you would have done instead? I don't. I don't know. When I was a kid, the last time I had dreams about doing anything else other than music was when I was in Mrs. Young's class in second grade, and I talked oh, with my wow. friend Lee Hu and. The things that we dreamed about was I was either going to become a fireman, an astronaut, or a lawyer, and I'm not really sure. And then I never really thought about jobs or anything. And then I just ended up at music school. And where'd you go to music school? I went to a college in New Jersey called William Patterson. Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, do you know? Okay. Do you know Jimmy Leahy? Who? Jimmy Leahy. Oh yeah, I know. Him. Did he go there? Uh, he worked there actually while he was, he, he was like, uh, the handyman there. 
shut up. I swear. Yeah. And you know what? I'll tell you who went. Oh. I, this is really funny. I interviewed Jimmy and then the next, and then I, you know, Scott Metzger. Yes, of course. Scott, Scott, went, there. Scott went there. Yeah. But I interviewed Jimmy and then like in the morning and then in the afternoon, I interviewed Scott. And and Jimmy worked there as like basically a handyman for like ten or twelve or fifteen years while he was and doing music. Well, Scott was there. Uh, I don't know if it was the same time when Scott's there. Scott, I think, is a little younger. Jimmy's like my age, and Scott's probably yeah, 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 yeah. ten or so years younger than both of us. Yeah, Scott was there just finishing when I was there. Um, yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Another great guitar player who was there, uh, Jim Oldwan. Oh, Jim went there. I didn't know that. Let me tell you, man, that guy is an amazing guitar player. He was Have you done his interview? I, Have you done interview oh, yeah, him? I interviewed Jim, and then uh, he was down here about a month ago, and he was had a, he had a night off, so we went out and we hung out, and I was like, I actually went out drinking. I haven't done that in years. We had a really relaxing night, drinking and smoking cigars. Which oh, is that sounds cool. great. This is a fun question, man. What's your favorite New York City food? Um, I love food as much as I love guitar, maybe more. Um, I, New York has some, I, I, the, in general, the food that I love most in, in New York is like the cheap, authentic food like pizza oh, yeah. or, or like dumplings or noodles. Um, I've been craving this place in New York in in Flushing that does like a ham pulled noodle soup with lamb. That's great. The place is called Lamb Noodle Soup. Incredible name. Um, yeah, I love the know, pizza, man. Pizza, man. Like <laughs> Defara's pizza is is sublime. Like I got to be, I've been fortunate enough to have some really fantastic meals, and the thing that happens, like when you, when like one plus one equals three, you know, like wine and cheese, or like a great combination, and there's just something special about DeFaro's pizza that's unique and perfect, you know. Did I? Did I? I I, I don't know what happened. I need to like write these questions down because I get to I get so lost in my own brain and then I don't remember if I I don't even remember what the question was. No, you but answered it. Was it. it was favorite New York City food. food. Yeah, 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 yeah. You did it, man. The far as pizza. Yeah, right. man. Who's had the biggest influence on your life, both musically and personally? I think that I think Vic Juris as a in terms of like his effect on my life is still palpable. Um just in the way he was the perfect teacher for me. He was always really respectful. I really believe in like the tree of teaching because I taught a lot of lessons. The tree of like mentorship where you treat your teachers with a lot of respect as, you know, as if they are in control of your future, which in a lot of ways they are. And that a lot of times will elicit a respect back. Hmm. Not in terms of kindness or whatever, not like, oh, them being nice to you, but them respecting what you're doing. And so, and that teaches you what it means to be a mentor to someone, you know, like getting lost in these books and learning from videos and not learning from a human is good because you have access to a lot of information. But what, how do you use that information, I guess? And, you know, um, and you don't learn how to teach others from watching videos, which is part of it, you know? Where'd you get that attitude from about honoring the mentorship relationship? I think like growing up as a Chinese person, you, you recognize like a large nuclear family and you have like a thousand aunties and uncles. Mm. And I wasn't always respected, but like respectful to my aunties and uncles because I'm, you know, as an asshole kid, as we all are, you know, having, but those kind of thoughts are ingrained in your brain. And yeah. as you get older and you start to feel more respect and, um, you need those people in your life. You know, yeah. you, this is not an island. Like you don't make music by yourself. You make music with other people. Um, I thought that I was, 
I'm sorry. What, go I, on. No, I apologize. Go ahead. I just think it's like such an important attitude and it's like that submissive attitude because like as a, as a, a musician, as a side man, you serve the later, you serve his vision, mm. but they ask you hopefully so you can put your vision on their vision, yeah, double vision. And as a band leader, you choose your musicians either, you know, hopefully based on their on that their service to you, but you're also in service to them. You know, it's like goes both ways always. And you can get really get lost in yourself and forget that other people are there and you have to take care of them. You know, it's like Jerry Garcia was like, I want to stop doing this. And someone was like, you're responsible for a lot of people's livelihood. And he, he knew that it was important for him to keep going and it killed him. But it doesn't have to be that extreme. Sure. But you are you are responsible for other people. And I think that it's you know, like it's easy to get lost in like, oh my God, I I'm like losing my shirt on this, but you know, but those people are giving you something special. And that's hopefully that's why you've chosen them. So like, oh, like I want uh I, I on my record I have John Coward, amazing piano player, who's like one of my great friends, and I wanted him. I didn't want another piano player. Like I wanted what John had to offer me and I had Andy Borger play and I wanted Andy to contribute what Andy was. Andy wanted, and I wrote music around it, you know, and hopefully they responded. And I felt like they responded to that honor that I gave them and they honored me by working hard Mm. and giving themselves to the music. I thought did, that did I answer the question or you did, did. You, no 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 you totally did I thought that was an Asian kind of mindset or philosophy or viewpoint and uh, I wish I had learned stuff like there's a lot of wisdom in a lot of the the like the basic tenets of like Asian behavior that uh, you know I don't there's a lot of man I, it would be so easier if there was like a like that, you know, if school, that's the kind of shit that we need to learn in school, you know, not like, uh, you know, who bombed, you know, this country at this particular time or, you know, um, uh, conjugating a verb and, and maybe it's very idealistic and simplistic, but I think that stuff like that benefits you so like, you know, deeply and long term. And, you know, communication wise, just, you know, just relationship wise. I don't know. I I mean, everything, if we think about even modern politics, it's like, where is the respect anymore? Oh, zero. Anton Scalia and Ruth Bader Ginsburg were really good friends. You know, like that can't happen. That doesn't happen anymore. No. Because people are so. Yeah, it's about me. Animalistic about their opinion. It's very self-centered, man. How about personally? Who's the biggest influence on you? So Vic musically, or was Vic personally too? Um, I think that I've been, I, my girlfriend and I have been together for about five years and she's been very important to me, uh, teaching me about kindness and, you know, opening my mind. That's very nice, man. Because like you go on tour and it you come back and you're like a mess and you, you know, it's just, and she's not been there. She's been there in support of me, but in a way where I can like figure out what is, you know, like realizing that like I'm anxious and I'm all these things and just like being away. That's awesome, man. That's great. I'm happy for you. man. Three more questions and I appreciate your time. Any hobbies or interests outside of music? Uh, I surf, I play sports, but currently I'm in really into, I surf, you know, in Brooklyn, That's, uh, in Queens or Long Island. Do you really? This surf? Yeah. Right. My buddy used to surf out it's in the a fucking island. Island. It's like, uh, yeah, there's like yeah, 200 yeah. miles of coast. I know you don't usually think of Brooklyn as the Mecca of you know, surfing comes to mind, but yeah, my buddy, I, mean, it's, I would hardly call it a surfing Mecca, but there is surf and you can do it. Um, favorite place you've traveled. Um, I've gotten, I've been really fortunate to have been pretty well traveled. Uh, I love, I, last year we got to go on tour to New Zealand and that was pretty 
incredible. We went to a place called Taraneki, which is in the southwest corner of the North Island. Um, it's like a there's great surf there, but we got to play festival there, and that was wonderful. Um, I love, yeah, I think. You're, pre- you're pretty well been- balanced. You're, you're like what? seem really well balanced. Like your attitude is you're not like obsessive, unhealthy work. Well, Unle- I'm a fucking guitar player with like a gazillion guitars and amps. Of course I'm obsessive. No, but you're like, but you take time for like doing stuff and it seems like you're able to smell the roses a little bit. Uh, well, I, we're, we're, these are all from being on tour, you know, so uh, and, you know, I like to always say that I seem very calm, but the tempest is inside. Yeah. It's very, so, it's very Asian. You know that. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm expecting to hear some, like, the, you know, some, I need a deep quote here to fill this in to complete it, you know. Like I don't some, have anything deep. Some uh, last question, man. And, but I um, also love, uh, you know, like, the food in Japan is so wonderful and it's so easy south of France. Like, I don't know. I love a lot of places, but I, I come, I, I, I've, the last couple of years I've been on a, I, I was maybe thinking of moving somewhere to some other places. And what I came to realize in all the other places and in this place is that these cities are wonderful and these places are wonderful, but the thing that's really wonderful about them are the people that I know and I love. And that is what makes places for me. Yeah. You know, all these great in my mind, when I'm thinking about all these places, I love the South of France because I have two really wonderful friends that live in like the, in, in like the, in the Basque country in France. And I visited them and I love them. And I love Nashville because my friend Jamie Lydell is there and his wife, Lindsay, who's amazing. And their son, Julian, who's incredible. Uh, he's amazing. I don't, they showed me this party trick. I just was there where he, he's almost three and they can put on records that he's familiar with. And within one second, he can tell you what track number it is. And nice. it's fucked. It's fucked up. It's so fast. Name that tune for baby geniuses. And he just holds up his fingers. It takes him longer to choose like the cutout number on the floor than for him to recognize. It's pretty awesome. That's cool. Uh, but like people, you know, like the people are what's important. Sure. Yeah. Totally, man. Last question, and I cannot thank you enough for your time. This has been really cool. So fun. Anything you do to make sure you're getting the most out of your life and enjoying your time as much as possible? One of the – I'm a pretty messy person, and I can be really uh, cluttered in my mind. Um, And one of the things – one of the great lessons I learned from Jim Campolongo is to be organized. And I'm not organized. But I try to like respect time and like what it takes to do things and to be not hard on myself. That's great. That's like really important. But I'm very hard on myself. I am very, (laughs) you know? Yeah. This year was, I, I, you know, I came back, I went to Sudan last December and I ended up getting sick. Oh, came back and I, the travel is so crazy. And, you know, it's like 35 hours travel Holy shit. and came back and it was Christmas and I was like, okay, I'm going to like get, I'm like done with tour for the year and I'm going to January, February, I'm going to finish all this music. And I was sick for two months, you know, not from Sudan, but I like got food poisoning in Sudan and I came back and I was still sick and then I got a cold and it took me two weeks of fighting that and being ashamed of myself that I wasn't working hard enough. Oh my God. Just go to just go, Hey man, like you're sick, like just sleep and just relax. You don't have to practice. You don't have to write just like relax, you know? And that was part of this year. This year has been pretty great for me in terms of like mentally just coming into a good place, you know, and being okay with who I am and where I am, but not complacent. Just being like, well, today is today, and tomorrow's going to be tomorrow. Yeah, age yeah. will fix some of that as you get a little older. Like you become, like I'm super demanding of myself, but I'm a much more forgiving of myself. Yeah, exactly. You know, like I the the standard is always high, but like I'm more reasonable with me. Like it's funny you mention that because like my daughter was sick, and I got sick about. I never fucking get sick. I take really good care of myself, and I had the flu about I don't know eighteen months ago. 
I literally, I don't think I've done this in my adult life. I slept all day for like seven days straight and I was totally good with it. And in the past, I would have been like freaking out. How can you do this? this. I got to do this. You know, it's so stressful. I was so good with it. I was like, and I was really happy that I was so good with it because it was like, you know, I, I was like just taking care of myself, you know, really when it comes down to it. And I was just glad I was able to do that. It's tough. It took me a long time to get there. So, man, I can't thank you enough. Let me tell people where to find you. You're an awesome dude. I hope when I come to the city that you'll be playing somewhere. Um, Please check out Johnny Lamb. It's Johnny, J-O-N-N-Y, Lamb. And mostly you could find him involved with Sin Cane. And Sin Cane is S-I-N-K-A-N-E. He is also on Instagram at Johnny Parties, J-O-N-N-Y-P-A-R-T-Y-S. Although you're not a party guy, are you? I'm pretty mellow now. Yeah. (laughs) Uh, But Johnny Parties and uh, when... Johnny comes out with new stuff. He'll come back on the show and we'll roll it out here. We'll have a big launch on Everyone Loves Guitar for Johnny's stuff because it's good. And uh, thank you, man. Any uh, final words of wisdom? You guys, anyone, you can do whatever the fuck you want. Have a great fucking time and just have the best time. That, just fuck it. That, we that, Just do it. That may be the fucking smartest thing I've heard anybody say on this show. Thank you, man. That is great. Who the fuck cares? Just Who, have a yeah, just time. have a good time. Nobody, it just doesn't fucking matter right now. Hey, man. But also, ultimately, everything matters. So you know, you gotta be. <laughs> There's the Asian shit. He threw that twist in there at the end, dude. Thank you so much for everything, man. I really appreciate it. This has been yeah. great. Thanks for being so cool and uh, being transparent and sharing uh, your story, man. Thank you very Thanks, much. Thanks, Um. Everybody, thanks so much for listening. If you enjoyed this interview, please share it on uh, with a friend on your social media channels. We certainly appreciate your support. Please support Johnny Lamb and his music and check him out online. Check out Sin Kane. And uh, like I said, he's going to be coming out with some new stuff, and hopefully we'll get to hear it here first or talk about it here first. Make sure you go to the homepage of everyonelovesguitar.com. Sign up to get on our newsletter list. We'll give you advanced notice of guests coming in, and you can ask them your own questions. And most important, remember that happiness is a choice. So choose wisely. Be nice. Go play your guitar and have fun. Till next time, thanks for listening. Peace and love. I'm out. We hope you enjoyed this show. If you did, subscribe to the Everyone Loves Guitar podcast, and you can do this online at everyonelovesguitar.com or on iTunes. And if you like the show, please leave us a five-star positive review. The more five-star reviews we get, the higher our show ranks, and higher rankings mean we get to continue speaking with cool, interesting guests on our show. We'll see you on the next episode, and until then, keep playing your guitar and have fun making music. 